Thank you for listening to Live Worship Center, 1604 Golden Springs Road. And now, today's sermon. Somebody say, praise the Lord. Praise Thank Lord. you, Jesus. Thank you. Hallelujah. What an awesome God we serve. Amen. Yes. Thank you, Lord. We have transitioned out of our uh, sermon series on the Holy Spirit called Thread, which we follow with the IPHC, into A series about missions. I don't know what better transition you go from missions except from the Spirit. The Spirit is a Spirit that goes. Amen? When Jesus said go, He said that knowing that they would be in power. They waited for the Spirit and then He said go in power. And so the Spirit empowers us to go. A couple of weeks ago, we had the Argo family with us from the Philippines, and they were a wonderful blessing to us, and you guys were a wonderful blessing to them. This past week, uh, we had a few from the church go to Honduras uh, for a water well trip, and I've got some great stories to share about that trip and how God just he showed off. He showed off. I'm going to share that with the church next Sunday on Father's Day. And uh, don't miss that. But today, we have a special family with us. A precious family that I feel like I've gotten to know better and better over the past few months. They were wonderful hosts for us when we went to Haiti. And uh, uh, Ginger reminded me, uh, I'm a sweet tea drinker. Uh, our, the director of our preschool will tell you that. And I get tea every morning. Jenny Sparks makes it for me. Instead of coffee, I give me some sweet tea, and I come back around 10, give me some more sweet tea, and around 2, I give me some more sweet tea. And uh, I like it. But you don't find sweet tea in Central America, or at least not where we've been. But in Haiti, Ginger made us some sweet tea, and it was good. And I'm glad she reminded me of that. And so these are two, Roger and Ginger, two very sincere, precious, Man and woman of God doing God's work in a country that, that needs the Lord, that needs people like them to sacrifice. And I've seen it firsthand. And I know what they're about. And they love the Lord. And they love the people of Haiti. And so today we've asked them to come and share. Before they do, I'm going to say a, a word of prayer. And we're going to invite them to come. And I just want you to bless them today, all right? Heavenly Father, we just come before you right now. God, you know about all the circumstances and obstacles that are involved in the life of a missionary. Not just in the place where they serve, but back at home. And how, and how things can be overwhelming, how things can change and transition. And Lord, we just thank you that you're faithful and that you always provide, you always sustain. You always help us. You're a present help. And I know that you've been that for them. And Lord, I just pray that today, God, there's just a special anointing upon both of them, uh, of refreshing, of renewing, God. Lord, as they pour out of their hearts into our lives, Lord, pour into their hearts with your spirit. I thank you for this. I give you all the praise and glory and, and honor. In Jesus' name. Can you say amen? amen. Would you welcome Roger and Ginger Johnson to sing with us today? Praise the Lord.
Um, most of you know us. Most of you don't. Um, many, many years ago, this was our home church, the Celebration Center. Um, so you know who we are. Diane and so many others, Sandy, Johnny, Stephen, Crystal, Kenny, uh, I've watched Mark and uh, Tim, I'm sorry, this is not easy. It's hard to come home and talk to people that you know and, and, and grown up in Christ with. It, it, it truly is. It, it's not an easy task. Um, I think of when Jesus went back to Nazareth. It was difficult for him there. Not that I'm related to the same way, because I know your hearts. You love the Lord, and you're going to receive everything God has for you. But the old saying, it's hard to go home again. It's hard. It truly is. But I, the point I'm trying to get at is that we're not pastors. We've never pastored the church. Um, Alan Coley also came out of this church, and they're doing a wonderful job. They planted the church there in the Philippines. And what Roger and I want you to see from what we share today is that missions is not just one thing. It doesn't look the same way in every place that you go. The missionaries that you talk to are doing different things that God has put on their hearts to do. Um, Roger and I, God uses us a lot for the gift of helps. Um, those of you who know us know what Roger did when we were at this church. You know what I did here at this church. Basically, we did whatever our pastor asked us to do to help the church and to do what needed to be done. We're doing the same thing in Haiti with our national leaders. We're helping them so that they can present the gospel of Jesus Christ to their people. Because whether we like it or not, in a lot of countries, the American is not well received. They don't like our white faces unless we're handing them out tons and tons of money. That's the truth. That's the reality. So missions has changed so much over the years to where now many missionaries are actually doing what they can to help the national leaders proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ. And that's what we do. Just a few little stories to tell you this morning to let you know what we do. I'm a nurse. been a nurse for 30 years now. Roger. Cause himself a jack of all trades and master of none, but I call him a jack of all trades and master of many. Yes, he is. Because whatever he puts his hands to do, he does it well and he does it with excellence. Yes, he does. Um, but there was a little boy named Jean Pierre Michel who, one Wednesday night after service, his mother, who's a single parent, by the way, brought him to our apartment because the church, those of you who've been there, Jonathan knows, that the church is just right across the compound from our apartment. And at that time, we didn't have a wall or gate up. It was open. And they were banging on our door. And he was had a nose bleed. I mean, his blood, nose was just pouring, pouring blood. And um, I got an ice pack, and when he got the bleeding stop, and they kept saying, whoosh, whoosh, which is Creole for rock, and pointing up his nose. So I got a flashlight and looked, but it wasn't a rock that was up his nose. He had a paw up there, huge ones, almost blocking the whole airway. They wanted me to pull it out. I'm thinking, if I pull that out of there, I'm going to damage something. And this boy is going to be having a lot of problems, more serious than just his nose bleed. Well, there's no translators, so by the grace of God, I somehow managed to make them understand that I can't do that. But I'm praying and asking God to show me what to do because I'm new to this country. I don't know where all the resources are. And he directed me to another missionary. And I asked him questions of, about another instance that came up. And I remembered that. And there's a foundation called the Lee Foundation that's a pediatric surgical team that comes to Haiti twice a year in the spring and in the fall. And the Lord told me that's where he needs to go. So I made all the connections, made all the arrangements. It was going to be several months before they were there, but I, made it, I contacted who I needed to and gave them the information about this child. Well, they got there, and usually they evaluate the first trip, but it's six months later when they come back before they do the surgery. Not in Jean-Pierre's case. 
They saw him and did the surgery the same day for that child. And his mother now wants to cook for me, clean my house, wash my clothes, <laughs> and, and do everything she can to show her gratitude. And, and I felt kind of like the Apostle Paul when they were bowing down at his feet, worshiping him, and saying, no, I'm a man just like you are. The glory goes to God. Yes. And that's what we try to tell the individuals and the families that we do help in Haiti, is that we're just a tool. Any thanks and gratitude you have belongs to God Almighty and His Son, Jesus Christ, because if it weren't for them, we wouldn't be here. Um, and I really appreciated the songs that were sung. This one, the first one especially, because um, Kenny and Mary may remember when we were in South Africa in 2011, the devotion I gave about love. Well, God's not let go of that in my heart. Even to this day, all these years later, I can't get away from John chapter 14, 15, and 16, and Romans 5, 5. Because I've dealt with God about love, what love is. Here in America, we tend to associate love with a feeling, with an emotion. And it's not. It's action. It's action. It's doing the work of God. And it's in St. John, he tells us that if you love me, you will obey me. And that's what Roger and I are trying to do in what we're doing today, is just be obedient to God. We've had people tell us, oh, you're special. No, we're not any different from any of you sitting out there on the church pew. We have our struggles. We have our difficulties. We have situations that we wish would go away. And we have to deal with those things. But we know what God's told us to do. And that's all we're trying to do is be obedient to that. Because we love Him so much. And Romans 5, 5, I question God a lot of times. God, you're going to have to show me how to love these people. I don't know how to love these people. And he, he just reminds me of that one simple verse in Romans, that the love of God has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit. The love is there. If we're Christians, if we're children of God, the love is there. All we've got to do is walk it out. Do what he tells us to do. Be obedient. And then the love of God starts shining forth and, and coming through. There's so many stories that we can share about Haiti. Um, but Roger's going to share a little story with you right now. I'm going to start off a little bit different. I'll tell you a story. I'm going to, go, I'm going to read the scripture. Oh, the glasses up there. Out of Matthew uh, 28. Starting with verse 18. Here it was just uh, Jesus was talking with the disciples and all of us up on the mountain before he was seated at the heaven. And it said, Jesus called, came and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go thou for and make disciples of all the nations, baptize them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you, and lo, I'm with you always, even to the end of ages. One thing that I do in Haiti is we have a strong leadership in Haiti. We have a bishop, we have pastors, we have churches. We have 37 churches in Haiti and 18 schools. But these churches are scared all around. And the roads are so bad there. One church I went to, 70 mile trip. It took us four and a half hours to make it sit down a trip one way. That's one of my jobs is carrying our bishop to these churches. I drive. I have a good vehicle. He does not have a good vehicle. I won't go in my vehicle because I don't want to be broke down in a creek bed somewhere because I had to drive to a creek bed. And that's one of my things. So I carry him where he can make the disciples. He knows more of the culture. He's Haitian. I'm American. I don't know their culture at all. I know how to eat beans and rice and chicken. <laughs> but I don't know their culture. He does. And he's their bishop. They have been their bishop. And so they really respect him. When they see a white come up, they know I'm a missionary, but they don't know him. I haven't met this pastor before because they're so far out in the woods. I haven't met him. I have met him some, but not him. And that's one of my jobs. Mine 
fixing plumbing work, all kind of things like that, welding. I have welded more in Haiti than I have anywhere when I was in the United States. You name it, it's steel, a lot of the doors are steel, they break, I weld. Mechanic. I have seen stuff on vehicles, I have scratched my head. It's like, what did, what are the, what? Whoa, what was they thinking? <laughs> the nut don't fit the main stern right, but they got a car with a nail in it. If the nail breaks and the nut falls off, the main stern rod is going to come off. And I got 20 people in the back of my truck. What? Why didn't he just go get a nut that will fit it? That's some of the things I have found. But there was an older gentleman was there. He was a, ma a master finisher of cement. He done all the plaster and all the buildings that had been rebuilt after the earthquake. Well, he had a major stroke. And his house was destroyed during the earthquake, but he never got a home. And here he is with a stroke, can't walk without a help. And then in the end, he couldn't even walk at all. But me and our leader, we made it a mission to get him a house built. So we started out just slowly. And uh, somebody donated $5,000. So here I go. We get it. Get the foundation done and we get the block up. Get the beams poured, the windows in. I said, okay, well, we got this far. He had blocked up and the beams were poured. No floor, no roof. Got another team to come in. They had enough money. We poured the floor. The team come in. We finished putting the rock, the roof on, and the doors in. He passed away. But now his wife has a home. That he wanted her to have before he passed, but he, he didn't have it. But the little house is no bigger than the stage. It's two rooms. But that's the average size. Really, their home is bigger than some of the Haitian homes. On our compound, we have a school. And on, in the next school, it goes from kindergarten through high school. Now, kindergarten there starts to bring you up. So every morning, I love kids. My beautiful grandchildren are here with me this morning. And my son, but I love children. So every morning, the white block, that's what they call me, the block, they don't know me, go out and see the children. At the first school year, some of them are scared to death of me. They don't want to see me, they run from me or cry. But before the end of school year, they know who I am. They come and they want me to touch them and love them. Yes, I have picked them up and I have been wet on them. <laughs> it just happens. But I love the children. Because the children in Haiti will one day be rulers, be pastors, be parents. I want them children to feel love. Because it's different there when the children get up so old, the parents just kind of like push them aside, and if they have older children, <coughs> older children take care of the younger children because the parents are always busy trying to make a dollar to buy food. If I'm not mistaken, the average Haitian makes a dollar a day. Two dollars a day. Two dollars a day, that's what they have to live on to buy beans and rice or whatever they can find to, to eat that day. They, they can't buy for tomorrow because they don't have refrigerators. They don't have enough water. They don't have plumbing in their homes. Dirt floors, most of them. But that's the way they are. And they're in survival mode because they're trying to survive for the moral. When you talked about living on about $2 a day. The national unemployment rate in Haiti is about 32%. The literacy rate in Haiti is about 50%. So half of the population can't read or write. Um, about 50% of the children that live in Haiti get to attend school. And of that 50%, only about 25% ever have the privilege of going to high school. They may make it through primary school and that's it. 
Many of them, he mentioned, they start school at the age of three. They may make it through kindergarten, and that's it. And, and they don't get any further education than that. Um, so our schools are very, very important uh, in Haiti. We have five schools there that are supported by the IPHC's People to People program. Um, and sponsorship for our children is always a high priority. Um, we're trying to look at some different ways of promoting that. Um, having a, a, someone sponsor a child in Haiti is a little difficult because the child that you sponsor may not be in the school the next year. And the principal and our people, people director, though they may try to follow up with that child and find out what's happened, they may never know what happened to that child. That child may have died suddenly of an illness. Their parents may have picked up and moved to another part of town because of work situations. They might have found a job somewhere else, but they don't explain to people what they're doing. They just pick up and go. So we're looking at trying to get people to look at sponsoring our schools instead of a child. Schools in Haiti, we have to pay our teachers or there's no school. We want to feed those children because most Haitians don't eat three meals a day. They eat one meal a day if they're fortunate enough to be able to get enough food for that one meal a day. And it's going to be rice and beans. Um, so we try to make sure if there's enough money coming in that those children while they're at school get a good hot meal while they're there. And sometimes that can be a struggle for our director and for the principals because they have to make a choice. Well, do we pay the teachers this month or do we pay the children? Because if we pay the teachers, we're not going to have any money for the food. It, it's a big issue. Um, orphanages are rampant in Haiti. You find an orphanage just about on every corner, just like you find a church just about on every corner there. Most of them, though, are scams. People who are using the children to pop, try to put money in their own pockets. And those children are not cared for. Uh, I would like to say that if it's American run, that it's different. But unfortunately, there have been a few instances where it is American run, and it's not any different. Uh, this is a sad reflection on the state of the world that we live in. But the IPHC many years ago decided that in Haiti, we want our focus to be on keeping families together. We love our families. I mean, I am so proud and honored to have Matthew and Julie and my grandbabies here with us this morning. Families are important to us. We would do anything for our families. Well, the Haitians are the same way. They love their families, and they would do anything they could to provide for them, which is why you may go up into a rural mountain area, and you may have a woman come up to you that looks like she's about 16 or 17 years old, and she's got five kids, and she can't feed any of them. And she may look at you and say, well, well, this did happen to me at our Rose Church. She walked up to me and someone came up to help translate for her. And she said, how many children do you have? I said, well, I have one son and he's grown. She said, good, you, have, you can take one, take mine. I said, I can't do that. And she really got angry and upset. She says, you have the ability to care for my child. Why won't you? That, that's the situation that we see in a lot of places in Haiti. They're so desperate for their children to be taken care of that they'll give them to a complete stranger in hopes that they'll be fed and clothed and educated. You talked about the children a while ago not having the affection that they need and that they get pushed aside at a certain age. Basically, by the time they're about Darcy's age and they can start to walk and talk and understand some things, they're put to work with household chores. They have to help carry water. You'll see little ones coming back from the wells or from the creeks carrying little jugs of water, what they're able to pick up and tow. They're carrying water to take back to their family supply that day. Or are they getting on their little room made of straw and they're sweeping out their dirt floors and their houses? It's a different situation in a different environment, and we have really had to put a distance between ourselves and some situations we come across because it slaps you in the face every time you step outside your door. It's gimme, 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 gimme. 
But I tell Roger, you know, if I find in their situation, I probably wouldn't be any different. I always say, if you can't thank my children, my grandchildren, I don't know what I would do. But we told the Lord that when we went, that we would do whatever he wanted. And he told us one person, one family at a time, and he'd take care of the rest. And that's what we really tried to focus on. Yes, I've had people come to my door and want food, and I know that if I give them food, that I've got about 600 other students out here on the compound that are gonna hear, oh, Madame Wache gave them a sandwich. Let's go get sandwiches from Madame Wache. And I don't have enough food in my house to feed all 600 children. So sometimes I have to tell them no. And it hurts. When you know that they're hungry, how do you tell them no? It's where we have to pray for wisdom. I mean, it's, it's even here in the States. There are people here in the States that have legitimate needs that need to be met. But so many people are out there saying the same thing. How do you know which one is legitimate? That's where you have to pray and let the Holy Spirit lead you and guide you so that you know that you're doing what God wants you to do. Because when we do that, he says when you, when you do it to the least of these, you've done it unto me. And we try to do it to the least of these. When there's children involved, we really try to say, Lord, what should we do here? Not that I don't feel compassion for the adults. I do. But the adults have a little bit better advantage of being able to find some food somewhere than some of these children do. Um, and you never know. I, there was one one day I got um, up and went outside and they brought me a little six-year-old boy with his foot all wrapped up in dirty white lace. And when I unraveled it, he had one of the most severe third-degree burns on his foot that I had ever seen in my life. And been a nurse for a long time, never worked to burn me. And in fact, when I had to do continuing education on wound care, they'd bring up all these burn pictures. I'll be honest with you, I'm one of those that had to get up and leave the room because it really made me sick about some of you know, just because you're a nurse doesn't mean you can handle everything. But I just prayed, God, what do I do? So I just started treating him. Um, and put clean dresses on and I had him come back every single day. And I saw it start to heal. I saw that pink tissue that nurses like to see, that nice pink, healthy red tissue coming in from, from the sides and it filling in. And I told him, because he wanted to thank me, I said, no, Jesus is the reason that you're able to get the help you need. Jesus made the way. And that's something here in the States that I think we need to make sure of too, is that tell the people that we are reaching out and helping, you know, I'm just a vessel, I'm just a tool. It's Jesus that's making the way. It's Jesus that puts us in the situations that we need to be in to offer the help, to offer the love, to give the hugs and the kisses that these babies need and crave, to let them know there is love True love. Love compels us. Love compels us to do what we need to do. And Roger and I both could sit here and talk to you about Haiti and the different things that have happened all day long. Um, there's story after story after story. But I think Roger wants to share with you about a special young man who's come to mean a lot to us in Haiti. We have one young man that helps us out a lot. His name is Ezekiel. We call him Timano at Stanford. Tiny Mono. His daddy's name is Mono. We call him Timano. But Timano started working with teens after the earthquake and uh, he, learned, he learned English. And now he speaks to the English and all, but he goes with me when I need to go to town and stuff, and he 
Oh, when we first got there, when I didn't know the roads, he would tell me which way to go and, and all that kind of stuff. And, but he, he's a great help to us. And uh, T. Mono is, he's already graduated high school and he's in the ranks to He's wanting to be an electrician. And T. Mono is a good looking young man. I keep kidding him. I said, T. Mono, who's your girlfriend? He said, Mr. Roger, I have no girlfriend. Don't need no girlfriend. It costs too much money. I have to help my family. So he wants to help his family. Instead of being like a regular teenager or 20 something year old having a girlfriend, he wants to graduate and be an electrician to make good money. He really wants to work for EDA, which is a fire company in Haiti. He wants to go to work for them because they make pretty good money to help his family. Because he has oh, let's see, three, three sisters. Three sisters and four sisters and three brothers. <coughs> Most families in Haiti are, are big and all. But uh, there's, a, there's our little kid. See, that's why you can go and see every point right there. Uh, You may ask, why are we here sharing this this morning? The truth is, for us to do what we do, it takes finances. Not going to lie to you, it takes money. Um, well, this picture right here is the church and cabaret that Jonathan and them come and lay the block on. This is the front of it. Uh, this is... How straight that wall is up there. Yeah, <laughs> this front, this front right here was not done by them. Uh, <laughs> Sorry, Jonathan, the cross is not done by him. The side, the side wall in the front right there was done by him. Which, uh, they have probably pictured the side wall where Jonathan laid the dog. It was kind of a little. Okay. It's got a little. Whoop. I'm going to have to have a, I'm gonna have to have a longer truck so right there that looks fine. Oh. The, uh, the church it is so full. That the people sit out in front and out on the side. So we're enlarging it. Uh, instead of building a, just building a new building, we're just trying to enlarge it. We're going to make it uh, 10 foot wider and 20 foot longer. But that's it. That's where they went. And that's a big old mango tree right here in the front. And the watermelon tree is off, off over here in the left. If you can't see it, uh, we have watermelon trees in Haiti. <laughs> Oh, what would I do now? <laughs> um, well, like I said, it does take finances for us to be there. Um, we can't go without the finances. God blessed us. We never had our full support come in the whole time that we were there. But God knew we needed to be there at that time. So he made provision miraculously that our support account stayed in the black the whole time that we were there. It dropped down into the red the month of May when we came home. But we've got to get it back up there because now they will not let us go back until our full support, we have two months on reserve in there and two months coming in in a row consecutively before they will allow us to go back to Haiti. And Roger talked to T. Mono last night and T. Mono says, oh, we miss you, Mr. Roger. We talk about you every day. We want you to come back. We love that family too. That is the first family that God has put in our heart and in our path to help. And T. Mono told me, he said, you know, Miss Ginger, before y'all came, we didn't think that any of us would be able to complete school. There's seven children in that family. There's actually three boys and four girls, um, which is another story in itself because it is a year and a half before we realized that there were seven children instead of five. Um, again, that's another story. But all of them are in school. Um, we pay his mother, my dad and to help us, help me keep the house clean because it is dry and dusty and there is no central heat and air so the windows have to stay open and I can get dust and then an hour later you go about that much dust back in its place. So it is, uh, I told Roger, we live in the Caribbean. It's supposed to be a tropical island and yet I live in the middle of a desert. Go figure. But 
all that aside, we would love for you, if God puts it in your heart, to help us get back to Haiti. Does it take much? God told me uh, the first time 400 people give him $10 a month and we would have our support. Well, our support's a little bit higher. I haven't quite figured it out, but you know, it doesn't matter what I tell you we need. If God puts something in your heart, love says we love him, we obey him. And that's all we ask you to do is if God speaks to you and puts something in your heart to help the people, the families of Haiti, then just be obedient to him and pray for us because we do covet your prayers with everything that is in us. Yes, finances get us to the field, but the truth of the matter is prayer keeps us there. And I have had many people tell me that they prayed for me at specific times when things got really hard and I wanted to scream and right throw up in the towel and come home. But we didn't. God prevailed. And we call our ministry Two Hearts for Hate because that's what it is. It's two hearts that are joined as one, that want to be obedient to God and follow the path that he's laid out for us and for us that happens to be serving the people of Haiti. God bless you, John. Thank you very much. Not everyone who comes to the church can I say I can I say that I've seen it in practice, but I've seen it in practice. And uh, they describe it very well. They do whatever's needed. And uh, things just pop up all the time that's needed to be done. <laughs> the list never gets shorter, does it, Roger? Um, there's a list of, of things that need to be done at churches that, that, that a new day presents new challenges and new obstacles. And uh, they do have a heart together. It's, it's, it's unity. And they're serving. They are serving. I, I don't know if I've seen a servant's heart the way they have one in that country. And um, the kids, that, that's when they got me. The kids just flocked to them. They loved them. The kids loved them so much. And uh, Roger, you know, told me a little bit when we were down there that some of the, some of the kids, he shared that a little bit, were, are scared of him at first. <laughs> but he wins them over. I mean, he just wins them over. And then they, they just love them. And they're doing great work down there. And so we want to give you the opportunity today. Uh, and what we're going to ask you to do is pray. Uh, if you would like to give a one-time uh, gift, to the, to the Johnsons, that's quite all right today also. If you receive the offering, you can do that. If you want to take your prayer card home and you want to pray over that and, and pray about what God would have you to do on a monthly basis, please do that. Please do that. Um, we want you to follow God, and that's what we're saying. It's whatever God leads you to do for them, uh, let's do it. But let's be a part of getting them back to Him. Let's be a big part of that. And so... I'm going to go to the Lord in prayer. And Mom, if you guys will get ready just to lead us in a song of worship. And uh, as we're worshiping, I'm just going to uh, welcome you to come up and we're going to receive our tithe and our offerings uh, in worship today. And so if it's all right with you, if you just bow your head right there where you are, close your eyes. Let's just ask the Lord to begin to speak to our heart. Thank you, Jesus. Heavenly Father, we just come before you. We thank you, God, for the calling that you put in the hearts of Roger and Ginger. And we thank you, God, for their faithfulness to go. We thank you, God, for providing each and every step of the way. And we thank you ahead of time that you will provide for them. is in your hands, Lord. Because of that, our future, it is safe. It is secure. We don't step out in faith.
without you sustaining us and keeping us. And Lord, as they, as they walk this walk of faith, I just know that your faithfulness is going to keep them on solid ground. You want to use us in the process, Lord. You want to give us the opportunity to be a part of your faithfulness to this family. So, Lord, I just pray that right now your Holy Spirit begin to speak to all of us in what we can do and how we can make a difference. And, God, don't let anyone feel bad about the little that they have to give. God, I thank you, Lord, that you bless them for the way that they give, the attitude that they give, knowing that every gift is a blessing to this family, is a blessing to your heart. We give you all the glory, the honor, and the praise in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen? Amen. Amen. Let's stand. If y'all would lead us in a song, and as they sing, uh, would you come and just give to the Lord today? If you're giving specifically to the Johnsons, please put that on your check in the notes. You can make your check out to life. Make sure you put it in the notes that it's for the Johnsons. If you're giving cash, make sure that it's in the envelope and you're not on the envelope what it is for. If you want to do the text giving today, you can do the text giving today. Um, can we do this as a part of worship? Because as we worship today, as God leads you, let's come. Let's give today. For listening to Life Worship Center, 1604 Golden Springs Road, where we are proclaiming the way, the truth, and the life. For more information about our church, visit us on the web at www.lifewc.org.